All right. Hello, everyone, and welcome. Um, I'm very excited for today's presentation. This will be the first of hopefully many joint grand rounds for the departments of medicine and psychiatry. I just want to take a brief second to remind everyone that chat feature is enabled. We'll allow you to post questions or comments at any time directly to us on the panel. Feel free to use this during today's presentation and we'll consolidate those questions in the last 10 minutes of the hour in a brief question and answer session. And on that note, I will turn it over to Dr. Joe Saramelli to introduce today's Grands Round speaker. Thank you. Hello, my name is Joe Saramelli. I'm a psychiatrist and I oversee the Grand Round series for the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences here at UW. I uh, thank you to the Department of Medicine uh, and for uh, jointly hosting this Grand Rounds today. And I, it's, uh, I, I feel very honored uh, to be able to introduce today's speaker, uh, Dr. Kurt Kroenke, uh, who is the Chancellor's Professor of Medicine uh, at Indiana University School of Medicine. Uh, I think if you, if you think about walking into most primary care clinics, uh, you'll often see uh, two things. Uh, one is a high proportion of individuals uh, presenting with symptoms. Uh, and the other is routine use of symptom measures to screen for uh, symptoms, to inform diagnosis, monitor treatment of sy symptom-based conditions. And in these two areas, uh, Dr. Kroenke has spent several decades uh, researching common symptom constellations, their assessment in primary care, and has developed uh, effective clinical interventions for some of the most common clinical presentations uh, in primary care. For example, he developed uh, the PHQ-9 measure uh, with colleagues, uh, uh, the common measure of depressive symptoms, the G87 measure of, of anxiety symptoms. And the clinical trials he has led in depression care, in pain symptom management, uh, with collaborative care and with telehealth uh, care interventions uh, get directly at the daily practice of so many clinicians. And the results of several of these trials have been published in JAMA. Um, a couple of background points about Dr. Kroenke. Uh, Dr. Kroenke completed an internal medicine residency at the Tripler Army Medical Center in Honolulu, and then worked for almost 20 years in three Army medical centers, including at Walter Reed in Washington, DC. And since 1997, uh, he has worked at Indiana University uh, School of Medicine and Wishard Memorial Hospital in Indianapolis, uh, where he has directed a number of research and training programs, uh, including serving as the director of the Indiana Clinical and Translational Sciences. Uh, nationally, Dr. Kroenke has also served as president of the Society of General Internal Medicine uh, and was program chair in 2002 uh, for the American College of Physicians annual scientific meeting. In 2018, Dr. Kroenke received the Robert Glesser Award for Lifetime Achievement from the Society of General uh, Internal Medicine. Uh, I'll note as well, Dr. Kroenke is also active uh, in, in a psychiatry subspecialty organization called the Academy of Consultation Liaison Psychiatry. And Dr. Kroenke had uh, collaborated previously uh, with Dr. Wayne Caton, uh, who's uh, really pioneered uh, the work of psychiatry in primary care. Uh, for, for many years. Uh, and I'll leave it at that for now. I'll stop sharing. And uh, here's Dr. Kroenke. Thank you. Let me first mention that this is a particularly good topic for um, the joint grand rounds because it really bridges uh, my two interests, medicine and psychiatry. Also, um, at University of Washington, uh, both medicine and psychiatry are both particularly strong in research and uh, clinical practice. And uh, I've had the good fortune of collaborating with uh, individuals in both departments. I, I won't do a shout out because there's a number of them. So it's really a privilege to talk about this topic uh, to these two departments at the uh, University of Washington. I have no disclosures. Um, and the outline for my talk, I'm going to really talk about five themes. Um, the first three will take about a third of the talk, uh, uh, sort of the epidemiology of symptoms, the psychological comorbidity, um, and measuring symptoms. And then um, I think particularly clinically relevant, I'd like to talk about what I call efficient evaluation and generic management. Now, uh, I'd like to emphasize this is not a talk about one symptom. It's a talk about common symptoms. And so what I'm going to try to uh, convey is strategies that work across symptoms, regardless of type of symptom. 
uh, at the end, uh, some of this has been uh, summarized in a review I wrote previously about this topic. And uh, I'm gonna share a slide that uh, identifies nine common principles to um, which will be, uh, I'll illustrate during the talk. Now, it seems strange to say, what is a symptom? Um, well, it's an uncomfortable or distressing body sensation experienced by an individual that's not observable by the clinician. The latter are signs. To give an example, dizziness is a symptom, syncope is an event or a sign. Uh, nausea is a symptom, vomiting is a sign. Um, and the same with cough, hemoptysis, paritis, rash, palpitations, irregular pulse on exam, anorexia and weight loss. Um, the other signs would be example, hoarseness, edema, blood from any orifice. So I'm gonna be talking about uh, symptoms and not signs. The other thing is diseases are not equal to symptoms. So on the left, you have some common conditions we treat in medicine, um, actually often which are asymptomatic. And on the right, we have conditions which are examples of symptomatic conditions, but uh, nothing necessarily on physical exam in many cases or lab tests. Um, we tend to do very well in, in our evidence-based practice and in our training um, for diseases. Um, the knowledge that we have and how we approach symptoms tends to have lag behind. Um, there was an interesting epidemiologic surveys done uh, by two family physician researchers. Um, the first was Carr White in, in 1961, and 40 years later, it was replicated uh, by a Dr. Green. And it showed that in any one month uh, if a thousand, of a thousand persons, 800 people will report some symptoms. And of course, that means 80% of you who are listening today might feel tired or have a headache or back pain. Um, those we don't want to over-medicalize. Um, in both surveys, about one in five um, sought care, but very few in a, were in a hospital setting. Most are sort of outpatients. And in fact, um, Hospital settings are obviously not the best place to treat chronic symptoms unless it's related to the disease they're in with. So it's uh, largely something we deal with in outpatient practice, but that's both primary care and specialty, specialty practice. Um, it uh, accounts for more than uh, almost 250 million clinic visits a year. If you want to put it into three buckets, uh, uh, 40 to 50% are pain symptoms. About a third are respiratory, but a lot of these are common upper respiratory infections. Obviously, in the last year, there's been COVID, a uh, more serious condition. But um, And then about 22% are non-respiratory, non-pain symptoms. There is a literature to say how often symptoms are unexplained, which means after the initial evaluation, it's a symptom-only diagnosis. Um, one study we did years ago showed it was three quarters. Another study we did showed it was one in five, but most of the point estimates come into about a, th a third. So clearly a third of symptoms that you might see in an outpatient setting, if you were to do a physical exam and laboratory tests, that's not where the diagnosis is uh, uh, going to end up from. Um, there was a quote that I like from a Dr. McKenzie, who is actually a British first general practitioner, and then had an interest in cardiology um, about 140 years ago. And he, he said he had come to the full realization of the fact that he recognized when the patients had some physical sign and when disease had made considerable ravages in the body, a moderately active diagnosis could be made. But in the vast majority of patients, there wasn't a sign, or if there was a sign, it was not sure of its relationship to the patient's health. And that would true, be true of a lot of symptoms we see, whether it's back pain or dizziness or headache or, or fatigue. Um, there's actually literature on difficult visits and here's four studies. And it indicates that about at least one in six visits uh, are perceived by the uh, clinician to have been a difficult encounter. And uh, that means if you see in an average half day practice, you'll probably have one difficult uh, encounter. And that uh, it's not really related to medical comorbidity. They've done analyses on it. And it really seems to be one of the strong driver is the more symptoms a patient has, uh, the greater the likelihood um, that encounter might be perceived as difficult. Uh, a couple other things uh, for epidemiology, a couple last points. There's a metric called years lived with disability. 
and it indicates how common the disease is, how many years the person lives with it, and how much disability it causes in their, uh, particularly in their work and, and social life. And uh, on this side of the slide are the 12 leading medical diseases, and in parentheses, there is their rank order among the top 30. And these 12 diseases account for about 8.8 .8 million years lived with disability uh, in the US. If you just put these pain conditions here, and you remember pain is 40 to 50% of all symptoms, these pain symptoms account for 9.7 million. And then if you add depression and anxiety, which coexist in about 40% of people that have uh, pain and other chronic symptoms, that it uh, tends to overweight the disability from uh, many of the diseases that we're, we're trained well to deal with. That was the quantitative, the, uh, I like this qualitative aspect where Emily Dickinson in one of her poems said, pain cannot recollect when it began or if there is a time when it was not, um, it has no future but itself. So that's a, just some brief highlights of the epidemiology of common symptoms. Um, I wanna move on to the overlap between physical and psychological symptoms. And so, uh, as I said, there's been interesting work done at the University of Washington over the years. Uh, this is by Greg Simon, uh, published a while back in the New England Journal. It was a World Health Organization study uh, in 15 different countries. And then they looked at uh, 1,146 cases of major depression and found two thirds in a, a primary care setting present only with physical symptoms. I'm tired, I have a headache, I'm not sleeping and not, I'm depressed. Um, and 50% had multiple symptoms, which is defined as three or more physical symptoms. So physical symptoms is most commonly the language in which depression and other disorders like anxiety present in a non-mental health setting. Uh, in, a, in a study we did years ago in developing the Prime MD, a, a measure for uh, diagnosing mental disorders in primary care, it was the uh, progenitor of the patient health questionnaire. We looked at uh, what the um, uh, psychiatric comorbidity in patients with unexplained symptoms, and what you can see is, regardless of the symptom, 50 to 60 percent had depression, code current depression, and 40 to 50% anxiety. There's another nine symptoms in this 15-symptom uh, measure, and, and the prevalence was, was similar. So the type of symptom didn't matter. The number of symptoms did. So that uh, on this 15 physical symptom checklist, as you went from zero to one to two to three symptoms endorsed, uh, four to five, six to eight, and nine or more, that there was a strong incremental increase in the likelihood of depression or anxiety. So people who had zero to one physical symptoms, very few had depression or anxiety, four to seven percent, all the way up to 80 percent if you had nine. And so uh, I sometimes say that uh, the physical symptom count is sort of a sed rate for psychopathologic inflammation. It's not specific, just like the sed rate isn't, but uh, the more physical symptoms a patient endorses, you have to be thinking of a, a higher likelihood of concurrent, uh, higher likelihood of concurrent depression or anxiety. Now, the other study, which was led by Wayne Caton, um, again uh, a legendary psychiatrist in the Department of Psychiatry, and also at University of Washington, also a founder, uh, uh, one of the pioneers in collaborative care, which I'll talk about in the uh, last part of the talk. Um, did a review along with uh, Elizabeth Lynn, a family physician at University of Washington and I, and looked at um, the disease specific symptoms in medical patients. So I was looking at unexplained symptoms. And what was interesting is in 30 studies where they looked at physical disease and had measured depression, they examined the relationship between disease specific somatic symptoms and depression and some in anxiety. And the four diseases were heart disease, pulmonary disease, diabetes, and arthritis. And an example of disease-specific symptoms are given. So it'd be like chest pain, dyspnea, and fatigue for heart disease. And what they find is depression explained as much of the variance in these disease-specific physical symptoms as did physiological measures of disease severity, like pulmonary function tests in um, uh, lung disease or uh, cardiac uh, angiography or stress tests or uh, echocardiographs in, in heart disease. 
that doesn't mean that the disease is not causing the symptoms, but it means if you have a patient with one of these diseases whose symptoms are not getting better, when in, in addition to maybe ordering more uh, tests or changing medicines, simply screening for uh, concurrent depression or anxiety is probably warranted. Um, I'll, I'll end with this second section by two quotes. One was from 2000 years ago and one was from 200 years ago, both by poets, Ovid and Lee Hunt, who was a contemporary of Keats, John Keats. And Ovid said, uh, I'm no better in mind than in body, both alike are sick and I suffer double hurt. And Lee Hunt said, the mind may undoubtedly affect the body, body also affects the mind. There's a reaction between them and by lessening it on either side, you diminish the pain on both. So um, there's an overword term called uh, mind-body dualism, but uh, they're really looking at the two as concurrent conditions um, and, and treating both uh, usually gets a better benefit in, in uh, ameliorating symptoms than just uh, treating, treating one or the other. So Judd mentioned that we've had a strong interest in, in measuring symptoms over time. Um, as an internist myself, I think of measures I use, um, sphygmomanometer for blood pressure, glucometer for glucose, peak flow meter for asthma. By the way, they all have the word meter in them, which is from the Greek word metron to measure. And so you might look at a patient reported outcome measure like uh, the PH29 here for depression uh, as a symptometer. This is uh, the PHQ-9, uh, which has had a fair amount of uptake in, in clinical practice and research. And so it's just the nine symptom criteria of uh, DSM depression. Uh, each item is endorsed in terms of frequency from zero to three. So you get a score from zero to 27. And this person has moderately uh, severe depression with a score of 16. Similarly, this is an anxiety measure called the GAD-7. Um, if you take the first two items of the PHQ-9 and the first two items of the GAD-7, you have a four item screener, which might be considered an ultra brief screener for depression and anxiety. We've also uh, uh, developed a, a somatic symptom scale, the PHQ-15. Uh, as you can see, five of the symptoms are pain, 10 are not pain. There is a version which is about half as long, which we call the SSS-8. Um, so these would be a brief, brief measure for uh, somatic symptoms. Interestingly, on all three scales, the depression, anxiety, and somatic scales, uh, 5, 10, and 15 represent cut points for uh, mild, moderate, and severe depression, anxiety, and somatization. In this case, you can see there's an incremental increase with the scores and disability days. In another study, where we looked at people with high counts, and this was uh, over 2000 primary care patients, um, that if you looked at high counts, that uh, about 6.6% uh, had depression, 8% anxiety, about 9.5 somatization, but you can see overlap is more common than pure forms of the disorder. In fact, pure forms of depression without anxiety or somatization is only 26%, and pure forms of anxiety and somatization are less than 50%. So sometimes we call this the SAD triad, the somatic anxiety depression triad. And it, it bespeaks the substantial comorbidity between somatic symptoms and psychologic symptoms like depression and anxiety. There's a website that has many of these scales on that can be downloaded for free. And there's PHQ-9 probably has currently over hundred translations and the GAD-7 probably 70. Um, some other brief measures, which I'm not going to talk about, is we uh, developed the PEG scale for pain. There's a suicidal screener that's quite similar to the Columbia, a multi-morbidity measure, a couple other measures. In particular, Dr. Saramelli, along with Dr. Fortney here in their studies, have developed a nine-item screening measure for, for mania as well. And um, so uh, I think there's a real uh, market out there. Uh, for these public domain measures and, and used in measurement-based care. The, um, in the last uh, part of the talk, I'm going to divide about uh, 10 minutes on what I call efficient valuation 
and about uh, 20 minutes on generic management. Uh, so this will be about half my presentation. And then uh, I wanna make sure we have 10 minutes at the end for questions. So um, if you have questions during the presentation, feel free to submit them to chat. So I'm gonna show you the three best diagnostic tests. Um, I'm gonna show you what I consider the top three. The first uh, I'm showing sort of illustratively here, um, which is the history and physical. So there's been a series of studies, uh, generally unfunded studies. So there are limitations to these studies. So I would look more for um, convergence of sort of modest uh, design studies and sample sizes. Um, and generally, if you look at the percent of diagnoses that come for symptoms from the history and physical, if you remember the figure 75%, it may be as high as 90%. And in some cases, when we looked at it, it was maybe 75% from the uh, history, 15% from the physical, 10% from lab tests. This is for common symptoms. Obviously, it wouldn't be true of diabetes because that's made by a blood test or high blood pressure, which is a blood pressure reading. But for symptoms, um, the, the greatest diagnostic value is in the history and physical, and in particularly the history. And that seems to be consistent across studies, which means we need an efficient way. I think the approach that we teach in medical school, which is great to teach uh, physical examination, is to say, do a complete history and physical. Well, in outpatient practice, you need to do an efficient. And so some years ago, we did a study of dizziness and found the three most valuable things on history was for the person to describe it in their own words, a few sentences, ask about the three key sensations, spinning, fainting, falling, ask the effect of position, lying down, standing up, and then three things on physical, the head hanging or hall pike maneuver, orthostatic uh, blood pressure and pulse and watching them walk. And so examples for other symptoms, we need to come up what I call the five minute exam uh, to say, you know, how do we decide how to proceed? Um, second best test is follow-up. Uh, in fact, I say follow-up is preferable to workup, maybe in the first one month or two of somebody presenting with a symptom. Um, Here's some studies done to see how uh, often people improve uh, within a couple of weeks. Uh, three of the studies had two week outcomes and the second study, it was one year, but generally about three quarters improve. So again, if you wanna remember the 75% rule, 75% of the diagnostic information is from the history and physical and not lab tests. And 75% of patients generally with physical symptoms will improve within a two to six week period, um, which means unless there's red flags, um, you can often defer more expensive elaborate testing for the people or the subgroup of patients who do not initially improve. Um, yeah, what do these have in common? Um, uh, I, I think of the uh, clinical pathologic conferences in the New England Journal, uh, I think of the TV series House, where maybe the person coming with abdominal pain had acute intermittent porphyria, which I've never seen in my life. Um, and, and here's from a textbook, important extra abdominal causes of abdominal pain. And these kinds of lists and so forth are fine, but generally they're zebras and not horses. So in an outpatient practice, you have to decide um, when to chase a zebra versus when it's uh, most commonly a horse. Now I know people in outpatient practice usually do uh, track down horses first, unless there's a red flag for a zebra. Um, also the long-term follow-up. So here's a series of studies on individual symptoms and the follow-up range on average about a year, uh, sometimes two years. And basically what was found is cell serious causes seldom emerged after initial evaluation. Um, so I think the concept, I'm missing something, uh, and that's why I need to do exhaustive workups, is generally in outpatient practice, the, the, the clinical evaluation you do and simple test and follow-up, um, it's really a quite small proportion that end up being something that you missed, as long as you follow them closely and look for something else that might uh, emerge in terms of a sign. Um, there's kind of an epidemiology based upon what I said of uh, if you had 100 people come in with a given symptom, um, about 20% would become chronic, about 75% would resolve in a few months. 
And it's a very small percent that are acutely serious. Um, this may be on the type of symptoms. So we tend to be a little bit more worried about ruling things out initially with chest pain, shortness of breath, syncope, and acute abdominal pain. These kinds of symptoms I listed on the right tend to be seldom uh, acutely serious. And so even the type of symptom might dictate uh, you know, whether you need to do a rule out early on versus being able to wait four to six weeks. Um, so the first good lab test, as I said, was the history and physical, particularly the history. The second good lab test was um, follow-up rather than workup. And the third good lab test is patient completing a questionnaire. We'll give you an example. So this is when I was at Walter Reed and uh, general medicine, two general medicine fellows did these projects and they looked at uh, consecutive referrals to gastroenterology, rheumatology and neurology. Now gastroenterology, they excluded patients being referred for screening kinds of colonoscopies and stuff. So they were being referred for evaluation of symptoms. That's true of most patients who get referred to rheumatology or neurology. Two points, uh, a quarter to a third uh, had depression on the PHQ-9. And if they had depression, the odds of the specialist finding a discrete physical disorder explaining the symptoms was only as quarter as likely. So doesn't mean you are not going to refer patients to specialists, but it also means that a very uh, a free lab test you might get uh, is, is, is probably a, a screener for depression and anxiety. Uh, these have lower value. These are more, especially for symptoms. Uh, we order a lot of these. I've given a few guidance about maybe more selective ordering, um, but they have less diagnostic value than the three things that I showed you. And um, then sometimes people say, well, I want to get it to reassure the patient. There was actually uh, interesting meta-analysis done. Um, first of all, uh, the prevalence of detecting a serious condition may be as low as a half to 3% when diagnostic tests are ordered in patients with a low probability. That means most of the positive tests are gonna be false positives and then you have to decide. Um, and in the 14 trials where they randomized patients who got a, say an X-ray or endoscopy back to reassurance versus um, getting initial further testing, they actually found that, um, that, uh, that the reassurance was quite, quite useful without further testing. So um, what I'd like to talk about now in, in the last 15 to 20 minutes, uh, the longest part of the presentation is, so now what do you do? What uh, you, you've looked, uh, you've, you've, if, if the symptom is measurable, maybe you've measured the severity of a symptom, uh, maybe, maybe you've done the three things that I talked about in terms of the history and physical and follow up and decide whether you want to screen uh, with, a, with a measure, a patient reported outcome. Um, what are some of the generic management principles? And I'm talking about common symptoms in general. And I'm going to talk about this in three sort of uh, compartments. Um, basically, models of care, multiplicity of symptoms, and what might be the messaging we give to patients in terms of communication. So models, um, I wanna talk about collaborative care, telecare and stepped care. Uh, you notice they're overlapped because the trials I'm gonna show you in one slide have elements of all. I'm gonna define them. So telecare, obviously we've all gotten very familiar with this the past year, more than uh, many of us had been. And so it's really using technology to provide patient care outside of an in-person in clinic visit. So it's, you know, sort of virtual or remote care. Step care means providing initial treatment at the simplest and least costly level and then adjusting upwards as needed based upon a treat-to-target treat approach, which I'll define, and patient preferences. And collaborative care is augmenting care provided by the patient's primary provider, using a care manager supervised by a physician specialist. And again, as I said, the latter in particular, one of the pioneering places of this was at the University of Washington with, with Wayne Caton and, and others. And this work continues um, at the University of Washington and elsewhere. The collaborative care generally um, has a, there's the primary clinician who is the primary 
Now, this has also been studied in specialty settings. So in oncology and in neurology stroke clinics. So the primary clinician could be a specialty clinic, but then um, there's a nurse care manager who gets meets weekly with a supervising specialist. If the collaborative care study is on depression, it might be a psychiatrist. If it's on pain, it might be a pain specialist and so forth. And at the, the linchpin is the care manager who uses largely a heavy dose of technology to communicate with the patient through a variety of devices. So this is the collaborative care model. I am gonna show you one slide on 14 pragmatic effectiveness trials, which tended to use elements of all of these, collaborative care, telecare, and stepped care. So I'm gonna show them as one. First, I wanna show the standard of method we used in those trials is you take your target symptoms or conditions. It could be a depression trial, a pain trial. We've done depression and pain. We've done depression, pain, and anxiety, and recently Mayo Clinic and been a, a, a consultant on a trial is doing six symptoms, the spade pentad, which I'll show you, plus physical functioning. So you can pick one or more target conditions, and then you're either going to usually have a medication or, or behavioral intervention or both. And you're either going to have a usual care group or an active comparator. And many of these studies follow patients up to 12 months. So this is kind of the prototype design. Here's the studies. And now what I'm going to do is just going to take maybe two minutes and not for you to dig into the weeds here, but I want to show you, uh, in fact, I want to hide this. Yeah, I want to show you um, some general points here, because I'm not going to show further uh, uh, data from these studies. First, um, the average study had 200 to 300 patients. So among these 14 studies, there were uh, over 4,000 patients. Interestingly, the bottom one, my care, is one we're currently doing with the University of Washington on uh, depression and opiate use disorder. And the first one, uh, Jürgen Unitzer from University of Washington was involved. So it's kind of cool that on this list, number one and number 14, we're both working with the University of Washington. On seven of these asterisks, we were the lead in. On seven, we were a collaborating site on. So it kind of divides that way. The, the symptom, many of these are depression or pain or pain and depression. The CAMPS trial, we did pain, anxiety, and depression. A COPE trial of cancer, we focused on physical functioning. That was Andrea Cheville at Mayo. The SPADE. We focused on the spade pentad, which I'll show you. And uh, uh, the PACER trial, we're doing a telecare study of uh, patients with low risk chest pain and anxiety in the emergency department. Um, many of the studies were is in primary care, but some were in specialty settings, and I've highlighted those. Many times the control group was usual care, but four studies had an active comparator. And 12 of the studies used some kind of uh, medication algorithm. Eight of the studies used some kind of behavioral intervention and 12 of the studies used telecare and the double pluses means it was exclusively telecare. So these are sort of the backdrop of which maybe informs some of our thinking about collaborative care, telecare, step care for the management of symptoms. Um, basically, uh, what's the effectiveness? Well, the one that's been studied the most has been um, depression. Cochrane Review in 2012 showed 79. Now there's more than that. And they generally showed uh, the effectiveness. Uh, here, here's the numbers. Uh, there's been in later years, uh, pain trials, and it tends to be pretty effective for pain. Um, the two areas where it's less conclusive is PTSD. Um, and in PTSD, it seemed that enhanced psychotherapy delivery may be important. And in substance use, that's in fact, uh, one of the trials that uh, Kathy Bradley and Linda Barr is doing and we're collaborating with on opiate use disorder and depression, um, but previous trials have been inconclusive. So, um, and depression has been shown cost-effective uh, in 10 trials. What are the key components of collaborative care? So it's population-based. So you get a, you, you know, your registry of depression patients or pain patients. It's measurement-based. So you treat the target, which I'll comment on. Typically, there's a care manager as the linchpin who is uh, meets typically weekly with the specialty consultants, and they may also administer brief behavioral therapies, 
like a behavioral activation or problem solving therapy. Treat to target. This is a fundamental concept compared to many efficacy trials of specific interventions. It's not about screening, but instead of monitoring and follow-up, we put so much emphasis on screening for depression, screening for pain, but generally screening studies have not shown a difference in outcomes. It's only when you build in the active measurement-based care, adjusting treatment follow-up that makes the difference. It's not about your favorite drug or psychotherapy, but the outcome. So you might have to switch your medicine. You might have to increase or switch your psychotherapy or increase the number of sessions. Consequently, it's not about a fixed number of sessions, but the right number. It's all about changing or adjusting treatment until you get it right. And it's also cognizance of relapse. So a core principle is using measurement-based care to get your condition. And, you know, we're used to that. Isn't that what we do for hemoglobin A1C? Isn't that what we do for blood pressure? So it's no different for conditions like depression or pain. So that's models of care. The uh, second of two themes I wanna talk about under generic management, you need to be aware of multiplicity. And I'm just gonna show a few slides on this. And here I mean multiplicity of symptoms. So here's from two studies of 1,500 primary care patients where we use the PHQ-15 for physical symptoms. And you can see uh, we have it in five categories. Um, and you can see that generally there's a pretty good distribution of people who are sort of oligo, monosymptomatic to, uh, well, yeah, asymptomatic to monosymptomatic to oligosymptomatic. I'm using rheumatologic examples here to uh, more polysymptomatic groups. And so the norm is, you know, four out of five patients are gonna at least have two, out of, two or three symptoms on a checklist and 60% are gonna have four or more. So be prepared that the patient may be completing of fatigue or pain, but in the backdrop, uh, they're likely to have uh, concurrent symptoms as well. We've had some interest in the spade pentad, sleep, pain, anxiety, depression, and low energy or fatigue. So these five symptoms. We studied these, one in our chronic pain study, and another was a study where we just screened people in practice. And if they just screened on one symptom, we then went on and measured the spade pentad. And again, these five symptoms, you can see the norm is several symptoms. So whether you're looking at the PHQ-15, 15, 15 symptoms or the spade pentad, you get this evidence that, and that's been shown for pain too, most people who come in with back pain have several other sites they hurt at. So it's this theme of multiplicity. Um, not that you shouldn't treat the symptom that's most bothersome, but particularly if they residually feel like they're not doing well, it's particularly important to make sure there's not other symptoms, physical or psychological, that are contributing to how they're feeling. Um, there are some cross-cutting symptom therapies. Cognitive behavioral therapy has proven effective across all of the spade symptoms. Antidepressants have been uh, proven effective not only for depression, but in pain conditions and some of the functional uh, syndromes like uh, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, um, and other conditions. And exercise has a cross symptomatic effect. And then there's research that's been done when patients have had uh, what was called somatization, in other words, multiple uh, symptoms chronically. And they taught clinicians in primary care core strategies, including some of the things we talked about, don't overtest, have regular follow-up, um, and, and work, work more on, on functioning rather than maybe eradicating the symptoms. So these are some things that you might say are transdiagnostic across symptoms, transdiagnostic treatments. I want to spend the last uh, section here for maybe five minutes, and then we'll have the uh, uh, at least 10 minutes for QA on what I call messaging. So words can be therapeutic, but like drugs can have both benefits and side effects. So a few themes that I show on this slide from the literature, uh, some nice qualitative research done in the United Kingdom uh, by a family practitioner using audio taped uh, encounters. Uh, avoid normalization. So patients don't like to say here necessarily everything's normal. Avoid premature psychologization. In other words, just don't say if 
I can't, my lab tests and exam are normal. It must be psychologic. No, make a positive diagnosis of uh, psychological causes by screening for depression or anxiety. If that's normal, I just leave it as a symptom only diagnosis. They got headache, they got back pain. We haven't found a, a physical cause. We haven't found psychological comorbidity, but remember a third to half of all symptoms remain sort of symptom only diagnoses. I maintain etiologic neutrality which I've just talked about. So when it comes to, is it physical or psychological? I'm like Switzerland. In other words, uh, I don't, you know, move to one side or the other. I have to have a positive diagnosis on something on exam or testing that gives me a physical diagnosis, or I have to have something positive on psychological evaluation. Otherwise, I, I, I treat it as a, as a symptom-only diagnosis. This is a little risky, but I do say it's okay to offer tentative mechanistic explanations. There's a lot we don't know about the mechanism of symptoms. So uh, some people believe in central sensitization for fibromyalgia, that people's thermostat is set differently in the brain or their amplifiers turned up, neurotransmitter imbalance for depression, anxiety, neurally mediated colonic attractions for IBS. Um, that is helpful to uh, some patients. And I address symptom specific concerns and expectations. I want to mention uh, what I call some years ago, uh, 20 years ago, I had to write a piece in an uh, esoteric journal, Advances in Mind Body Medicine, in response to someone who had written about somatization and how it presents. And uh, one of the sections I called the profanity of naming. So, and I'm going to read this The history of labeling patients with unexplained symptoms is a cycle of which no name ultimately falls from grace. The original meaning of intent is lost. The name eventually becomes a dirty word. Hysteria, hypochondriasis, psychosomatic, functional somatoform, each in turn has become a code word among a large proportion of clinicians for illness that's difficult, not real in one's head, until we change the way we feel about this illness as a new name will become contaminated uh, eventually. Um, so now it, it led to more descriptive and less inflammatory naming of symptom syndromes, and I won't name them here. Uh, however, discussion of these syndromes in the same context as somatization is upsetting to some clinicians and many patients. In part, this is because somatization is a four-letter word disguised as 12 letters. So I'm going to give a couple examples here. So if you look at infectious symptom conditions, chronic symptom conditions, in the 50s, there was a condition largely with fatigue concentrating problems um, and pain and other things, very much like chronic fatigue syndrome or fibromyalgia. It was, uh, they would get some lab tests and then consider it chronic brucellosis. That went away. There was chronic mononucleosis in the, in the uh, 80s, chronic Lyme disease. Uh, now, people may in the Q&A session talk about what's long COVID syndrome gonna look like. Um, it's real and a subgroup of patients have it. So it's not the reality of it, but most of the symptoms are similar at this point to things like fibromyalgia and chronic fatigue syndrome. So here's another post-infectious condition with a tail to it in a subgroup of patients. Uh, I was in the army for 20 years. It was a big thing about Gulf War illness. Uh, after 9-11, the uh, World Trade Center syndrome, there was a sick building syndrome. Uh, in the 50s and 60s, there was a concept of hypoglycemia in the 70s and 80s, people with uh, ill-defined symptoms and echocardiographic mitral valve prolapse. These have kind of gone away. So these were conditions in search of a label. Uh, and sometimes we change the name to protect the innocent. So uh, previous names for DSM-5 somatic symptom disorder, hysteria, Burkay's syndrome, somat somatization disorder, hypochondriasis, which obviously has a lot of pejorative uh, associations with it became health anxiety disorder. And a recent IOM report has renamed um, chronic fatigue syndrome or myalgic encephalitis systemic exertion intolerance disorder. I would claim that that if we don't change our attitudes towards it and are focusing on management, that too could end up being um, pejorative with time. So um, in it, this uh, is the last major point I wanna make. What's uh, dealing with patient expectations? We did two studies in 700 primary care patients. And before they came in the visit, they came in with symptoms. These are symptom visits to primary care. And we asked them if they wanted to know the cause, how long it would last, did they want a medicine test or referral. Pre-visit, all were common. 
After the visit, very few had an expectation for what I call physician action in terms of medicine testing or referral. Many still uh, wondered about had the physician uh, sufficiently talked to them about the cause or the prognosis. So my uh, suggestion would be at the end of a visit for an unexplained symptom uh, to explain to the patient what you're going to do and then end by saying, was there anything else you were worried about or you thought might help? So I'm going to give an example of specialist script A or B. When you refer to a person for a specialist, a neurologist, a rheumatologist, a gastroenterologist for a symptom, and the, the specialist says, everything's normal, we can't find anything wrong, follow up with your primary care doc. A script that would only take 15 seconds longer might look like our test shows some good news. The chest pains you've been having are not due to your heart. Pains like this can be due to chest wall pain, sort of bursitis, acid reflux, muscle tension, like headaches, or other common conditions. I'd be letting Dr. Smith know the results of her evaluation and a few suggestions on treatment. She's done an excellent job. Did you have any questions? Was there anything else you were worried about? So that's what I would suggest in a referral for a symptom that is then sent back to the primary care physician after evaluation, just to maybe take that extra 10 seconds or 15 seconds. And uh, I'm going to close with what I call management without mechanisms. And I'm going to read this um, because this is from that same essay. So this is on management. And it sounds paradoxical, management without mechanisms, but I'll describe what I mean. The overarching mission of science is to explain attempting to manage an illness in the absence of understanding its etiology may seem rather primitive shortcut akin to a blindfolded child trying to pin the tail on the donkey. However, I'm skeptical explaining symptoms will follow a similar pathway to explaining cancer, or diabetes, or atherosclerosis. And I believe management strategies can be evaluated concurrently with research. Uh, so I agree with McWinney, who is a family physician, who says many of these problems will be avoided if physicians and patients became less concerned with cause and more with care. These are the nine evidence-based principles from that article. And I, the first slide gave you the reference in the annals of 2014. At least one in three symptoms are unexplained. Three quarters of diagnosis come from the history alone. About one in four symptoms become chronic. Serious causes not initially apparent seldom emerge. Physical and psychologic symptoms commonly co-occur. Most patients have multiple symptoms. Some treatments are generic across symptoms. Symptom measures are useful for monitoring therapy. And patients, be, patients typically want more communication rather than more tests. I'll close with this quote by the famous clinical trialist and, and uh, epidemiologist, A. Bradford Hill, who came up with the causation criteria for causation of disease, who said, all scientific works incomplete, whether observational or experimental, all scientific works liable to be upset or modified by advancing knowledge does not confer upon us the freedom to ignore the knowledge we already have or to postpone the action that appears to demand at a given time. And I would maintain that's true um, with, with, with symptoms currently and how we might manage it in practice. So with that, I will conclude my formal remarks. And I think that gives us 10 minutes for Q and a. Absolutely. What a, what a, what a masterclass in so many things, including time management, um, the right ending right on time. Um, just a really wonderful talk. And thank you. The, the summary slides at the end, so rich, the, the nine evidence-based, points, uh, a number of questions have come up. And so I might start with um, a couple of folks talking about the sort of chicken or egg issue of symptoms and the, the, the psychological comorbidities. So sort of how important is it to sort of distinguish whether the symptoms preceded that psychological comorbidity or how might that, uh, how might you anticipate that change your management um, versus the opposite if the psychological state is what's sort of underlying the development of the symptoms? So I start with what the patient believes. So if they come in with pain and they happen to have depression, my conversation is, you know, pain commonly makes it difficult for you to sleep. You're tired the next day and you become irritable. And by the way, we have treatment for both. I even avoid the D word. I might save the D word because, you know, as soon as you mention depression, then it spins into all in my head, blah, blah, blah. I mean, you do have to get in the conversation. And, and as actually research shown, by the way, and in a paper we did, and when I give a talk on pain, there's been 10, 11 studies that show the relationship between and depression is not unidirectional, it's reciprocal. If you do antecedent studies, people start with pain, there's a higher risk of developing depression. If you do depression, there's a higher risk of developing pain. So it's, 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 it's like the chicken and egg. You need a chicken to create an egg, you need an egg to create a chicken. So it's reciprocal and it's not unidirectional. 
but I never start the conversation with, with trying to attribute it to depression. If, if they come in with a physical symptom, I start with that and I delay the conversation. And I, I, I would then say, it's the pain that increases these symptoms you're having and we can treat both. So you, you sort of step away from, as you're saying, the causality model and sort of work towards a management model and, and yeah. buy into whatever the, the existing narrative is that, that the patient already has. Well, and, and exactly, because some people believe in reattribution. Okay, I got to convince them it's due to this. I don't know, because I give an example. If somebody's got fatigue and they got class four heart failure and major depression, how do I know how much of the fatigue is due to one or the other? It's probably due to both. It's multifactorial. So, I mean, yeah. yeah. So I, it's because it's I'm not confident whether it's due to physical or psychological. I like to focus on the symptom and managing the symptom. That leads into a comment and question about sort of uh, you, you mentioned, you called it cross cutting. So uh, the types of therapies like CBT um, that cross cut and, and sort of um, how to think about these cross cutting therapies in patients in whom we do diagnose with an organic cause of their symptoms, uh, but in whom they may benefit from some of these therapies in the management of said symptoms. Yeah, I mean, and there's other cross-cutting therapies, but I just picked on CBT, which goes across uh, the spade pentad, physical and psychologic disorders, and uh, antidepressants, they have an analgesic effect and an anxiolytic effect, and they work in sim functional symptom syndromes, and uh, exercise less studied, but it seems to work on pain, uh, depression, anxiety. So those are ones that, uh, uh, if I have a specific treatment, if it's pain, I'll probably use analgesic therapy but they're likely to have other symptoms as well. So, um, and because people have multiple symptoms, I mean, I tend to, and I emphasize generic treatments today. So I didn't talk on pain specific and depression, but I'm a big believer in these trans diagnostic treatments. Yeah. Um, uh, an interesting point brought up that sort of two things specific to American healthcare is a question whether there's some evidence base that might suggest that Americans have more um, sort of symptom only diagnoses or more uh, so-called functional diagnoses than other countries. And then a subsequent follow-up question about how much do you think our uh, impediment to this type of care model is driven by the 20 minute clinic visit? So I do think, uh, it, you know, I mean, there's different things. I, the short answer is I don't know the difference in epidemiology, say, between America and developed countries and then undeveloped countries. Greg Simon's study that I showed was interesting because it was done across a range of 14 countries and, uh, and developed and undeveloped. Uh, and they did find the relationship between depression and somatic symptoms uh, tended to be cross-national and cross-cultural. Um, obviously, there's, less, there's more tests done in America, so we probably over-test. That's why I emphasize the value of history and physical and deferred testing. Um, I think we need to do more of that. I think sometimes we're driven by reimbursement. Uh, it's easier ordered. And, and I think sometimes we're driven by time. So the way I think is in the visit is, you know, if they come in with the symptom to the degree to which we can focus on that symptom and have another visit for their diabetes and hypertension, and then focus on a brief history and physical, like five minutes on that symptoms, and then maybe a four to six week follow-up, but it doesn't have to come back in. It could be, if you're not better, 75% of people get better in four to six weeks with your symptom. If you're not one of those, give me a call and we'll do a virtual visit or something like that. Um, so I think that kind of script to say evidence base, 75% will get better in four to six weeks. It's not going to happen all at once. It's going to be gradual. And if you don't get better, I have a plan. Yeah. Um, I, I think that I, I took away from that too, you know, the evidence base doesn't suggest this is only the worried well that are having these types of problems, that it is in fact the unwell who are equally worried and have sort of similar symptoms as part well, of their- you know, and those are all pejorative phrases right, it's because right. doctors don't like, I mean, you know, people come into the ER and say, why are you here? People come into primary care, why are you bothering? It's usually because it's something we don't feel as competent in treating and it frustrates us. It's that difficult encounter, the fatigue, the dizziness. And so we then say, why are you here? And- Actually, most people with those symptoms don't come in. Only one in five come in. They've already selected themselves that they have something they're worried about or something that they need reassurance on. And so that could be your best treatment. Mm -hmm. But worried well is pejorative. Yeah, you know? absolutely. Once they cross the threshold of the clinic, uh, the, they're not well in their minds. Absolutely. Um I, I, I will say if any other questions are on folks' minds, please do send them in through the chat. 
Um, Joe, did you have any thoughts or questions? I, I have one question, Dr. Kroenke, if you can comment on this, a, a tension that might exist uh, between um, sort of follow-up monitoring over time versus what's known for, especially for individuals with more serious mental illness who have you know, known shortened life expectancy, partly due to differences in quality of uh, medical care. Can, can you comment on that tension? Uh, can you just repeat the question again? Yeah, because I mean yeah, I got with, part of it, but then I was trying yeah, to. Yeah, with some individual. On. Yeah, with the what you've recommended for monitoring, uh, measurement over time, and follow up, uh, balanced with the individuals with more serious mental illness who who are known to have shortened life expectancy. For example, individuals uh, with schizophrenia, bipolar disorder. That's partly attributable to differences in quality of of medical care. Maybe not getting the same quality at times as, as individuals without those diagnoses. Yeah, that's it's it's a related question. I'm trying to think in terms of symptoms, how it would change my management. I mean, so they certainly get uh, 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 less attention to their medical disorders. And so, yeah, I mean, you know, there's a question that and it shouldn't be the psychiatrist has to do that. So they probably need uh, better linkage into primary care, whether that's embedded in the mental health clinic, you know, sort of reverse collaborative care, integrated care, or whether they have a primary care physician uh, who then could make sure you know, their medical disorders are treated. Most of the medical disorders will have signs or things that manifest it. So if it's a person with a serious mental disorder and they come in with pain uh, or, uh, you know, dizziness or things like that, I would probably still use the approach I said. So. Well, thank you so much. This was in just an incredible talk and a, and a really wonderful model for approaching the care of these patients with symptoms. Um, I'm struck by the overlap at there in the end in the management with sort of aspects of narrative medicine as well. So understanding the patient's story and, and coming to the table to help develop a, a collaborative story moving forward that can help palliate that symptoms and, and remembering that our, our role as the clinician is to alleviate suffering in the end. Um, just I, I want to close on that and we're at the end of the time, but I like the fact you said narrative medicine, but the concept of neurosin medicine sometimes mean I'm going to have to write war and peace with the patient as opposed to a short story. So there have been studies of communication that founds, finds that listening to the patient's story, mm. it only takes a minute or two and does not generally lengthen the visit. Um, we probably should spend less time on the physical exam in that patient, <laughs> probably spend less time on other things and maybe end the visit with two minutes and not order tests, but I, we still got to keep it in 15 minutes. And so my advice there is very efficient narrative for a minute or two, close the visit by saying anything else you're worried about or wanted, and then, you know, follow up in four to six weeks if it's not better, but we got to keep it in the bucket of 15 minutes and we got to cut corners and I have some suggestions, which I won't go into. Absolutely. Well, I think that's a, a wonderful note and bit of advice to end on. Thank you, everyone, uh, for tuning in. And uh, thank you again, Dr. Kroenke, for, for being here with us. Enjoy your Friday afternoon. Okay. Thank you all. Bye now. Thanks, Joe.